we uh, we used to we we were I was on a service ship and we service ships that were in different operations. Basically, we followed NATO exercises, and that in the Caribbean, the Mediterranean, the North Atlantic, that sort of thing. And uh, just to go back to kind of the beginning, so um, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Okay. Yeah, my brother was in prior to me in the Navy. He was on the USS Hornet, and then I was on, the, uh, which is an aircraft carrier, and then uh, I had went in when I went in. Everybody, you know, we, we were all under the threat of the draft, mm -hmm. and we all had to sign up for the draft, and I just made up my mind I wanted to go to the Navy. Yeah. Okay. And uh, where were you living at the time? I was living actually over in Lime Rock, Connecticut, yeah, okay. which is just a couple miles from here. All right. And uh, do you recall the date that you enlisted? It was in uh, October of 66. I can't tell you the exact day. Okay. That's the day that I actually left home and uh, went in. Yeah. Okay. And like you explained, you joined so you didn't have to, because of the threat of the draft, you just decided to enlist instead? In the Navy, right. Okay. And uh, why did you pick the service, the, the Navy? Why did you pick that branch? Well, I had gone to a vocational technical school and was an electrician, working for an electrician, and working actually in a motor rewind shop. And so I just figured I could um, extend my education in electrical field in the Navy was more opportunities uh, than the other branches. Yeah. Okay. And um, so tell me about your first couple of days in, your, in the service. What was it like? Um, let's see. Actually, we were, uh, I went to Torrington and to the post office there where the recruiter was. And then they took us down to New Haven. We caught a train down to uh, uh, New York City, down to Brooklyn, where the Navy headquarters was down there. And we, uh, they indoctrinated us there. And that evening, uh, they put us on a train for, Chica for Chicago, Illinois. And then outside of Chicago, um, at Waukegan, Illinois, is where the um, Great Lakes um, boot camp was. Oh, okay. And so that's, uh, there was three different camps mm -hmm. there, um, Camp Porter, uh, Camp Moffitt, and, and Camp Barry. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so that's where you served at basic training? Was that's where my basic training was, yeah. Okay. And uh, which fort did you serve it at? Which what? Where, where, where exactly did you serve, or, or where did you, exactly did you do your basic training? That was in Waukegan, Illinois. Waukegan, yeah, Illinois. Just outside of uh, Chicago. Okay, okay. Yeah. And uh, so tell me what that experience was like. Um, well, I was a young, naive kid, and uh, as soon as you get off the uh, train and arrive there, you know, they start barking at you right away, you know, and uh, you just, you learn to pay attention. And that's one of the things because there's there's no fooling around, and, and they they've got your attention span very early, <laughs> and uh, so you you just learn to keep quiet and and follow orders, and that's the one thing. Uh, one of the reasons I went into the military is because I um, I wanted to grow up, mm -hmm. and uh, that was a good place to do it. You learn you learn to uh, discipline. You learn to, when they tell you to be at a uh, certain place at a certain time, you damn well better be there, uh, or else there's consequences. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what kind of training did you learn in basic? Um, well, it was all military, you know, uh, about shipboard and things like that. You know, um, yeah, you have all kinds of firefighting schools. There's a tremendous amount of firefighting schools you learn because uh, when, when, you, every, every, when you have a fire on board ship, you can't walk away from it. Um, you're out there and you have to stay there and put it out. Mm -hmm. And every gallon of water you pump onto it, you got to pump back off the ship or else you'll sink your ship. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a lot, a lot of uh, skills about uh, operating a ship. That's what's. And then I, I return after boot camp that, you know, I came home on leave and then I returned there to, to uh, another training center at Great Lakes where uh, for electrical schools. Oh, okay. Yeah. And do you remember any of your instructors during all of this training that you were doing? 
Well, I can't remember their names right off the top of my head. I have uh, pictures of all our classes and that sort of thing at home. And, uh, and they were just some of the best men I have ever come across in my life. Yeah. Nice. They were just, you know, from all over. And the, the guys that I served with in the Navy, uh, they came from all parts of the United States. And, and they were all a little bit different. And, but uh, they're just the best America could, could offer. Yeah. So after boot camp, where did you go? That's, that's when I went to electrical school. I went back to Great Lakes. Oh, okay. Yeah, to uh, electrical school at Great Lakes. Okay. And I, I had an edge. We, there was about, I think, 45 to 60 guys in my class. Of course, I had an edge because I had been to a technical school before. So I basically, I finished first in my class wow. with a... I think I had a 98 average for, uh, I think it was 16 weeks in electrical school. And um, that's the one thing that I really appreciated about the Navy. You know, I got to le learn uh, and work on so many different systems, electrical systems and machinery that I would have never had an opportunity to work on, you know, and it was constantly changing. And then the fact that I went on to the USS Cascade. I got my first choice of duty, actually, because I finished first in my class. And while I was there in um, electrical class, I, I didn't have to stand any guard duty or anything like that. I was, um, they put me on as a night instructor because I, ha I was finished, you know, I was first in my class. And so I used to help the guys that needed to catch up a little bit. And that was a good opportunity, too. So how long did uh, electric sc uh, electrical school take? I think it was 16 weeks, if I remember right. Okay. This was back in 1962, and so or 62 and 60, early 63. So it's quite a while ago. So. Okay. And uh, so, what what did you do after electrical school? That's when I was assigned to the USS Cascade. Okay. You know, yeah. You know. right. I served a, a little bit on uh, destroyers, uh, and that's the basically the ships that I I worked on while I was uh, aboard the USS Cascade. We were a big repair ship. It, it was a, uh, it was an auxiliary ship. It wasn't a man of war like a destroyer or a cruiser or a battle wagon or something like that. Uh, we were an auxiliary ship, and uh, uh, destroyers would come to us for service. Yeah, and basically what I was saying is that we would follow NATO exercises. A lot of the uh, ships that were in service that time in the NATO alliance. Um, we're using a lot of our old World War II destroyers and things like that that we had sold them or turned over to them, you know, to make up the alliance. And we carried all the spare parts and weapons. And uh, so when they came to us, we had medical services. We had a doctor aboard and uh, I think there was a 35 or 40 bed uh, sick bay. We had four or five dentists aboard and we had shops on my ship that would, could do anything. You could, we had a foundry, we had machine shops, pipe shops, wow. uh, optical shops, anything you can imagine that ship could make. And um, it was quite a sophisticated piece of equipment, that ship, yeah. So describe to me a typical day on why you were on a ship like that. Like what, what kind of jobs did you have to do? Well, basically, when a ship came alongside of it, well, first thing in the morning, you know, we'd always have, uh, we'd muster and make sure everybody was on board that was supposed to be there. And, and then we would uh, start a daily routine. Um, ships that were tied up alongside of us uh, and we could handle, uh, when, when we went into a port, we could handle uh, up to 12 ships each side of us. And we had a big galley. We could feed them, we could do anything. Generally, they pulled alongside of us and they shut their plants down. And we provided them electrical services and fresh water. You know, we had a big uh, distilling system on our ship that we could, I think we made 100,000 gallons of uh, fresh water a day from the seawater, you know, and that sort of thing. Wow. So we supplied them with all their fresh water and, um, and all kinds of services. So they ate, on our mess decks with us, and uh, and then we went aboard their ships. They, what they did is they came to us with requests of what equipment that they felt needed to be repaired, and then we would go aboard their ships and test all their systems, their switchboards and their 
uh, read their motors and that sort of thing and, and check everything and make sure they were, everything was functioning. If there was any new equipment that uh, was coming out that should go on, we would install it and then instruct them on how to operate it because we were constantly upgrading equipment and making these ships um, you know, better and keep them in good repair all the time. Yeah. Oh, okay. And um, so what kind of area, or where did you go while you were on the ship? Like, uh, What ports? Yeah. yeah. Well, my home port was Newport. And we went, you know, to... Uh, we used to uh, go down the seaboard and, and fix ships. Uh, uh, Norfolk, Virginia, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, Pensacola, Florida... And every uh, spring, there used to be a, a, a NATO exercise called uh, Springboard, which all these uh, ships were in a NATO alliance would meet in, in old San Juan, Puerto Rico, and uh, they'd all have training out there. And so we would, uh, we would have it great all week long because they'd be out training and we'd be uh, Clean, get our shops ready and things like that, and then we could go on liberty and have a good time. And then when they came in on the weekends, then we would work around the clock uh, repairing their ships and doing anything. You know, we would repair our ships along with the, any of the other ships that were in the NATO alliance, you know. And then uh, other in the Mediterranean, we would go to, uh, into uh, Barcelona, Spain, uh, Naples, Italy, uh, England, Portsmouth, uh, we've been up into Halifax, Nova Scotia, any, anywhere where there was a ship even broken down and was having trouble, couldn't get out or something like that, uh, we would go in and after it, you know, and uh, if it was Turkey and Istanbul or anything like that, you know, we would go where, they, where we were needed, you know. Okay. And um, did you ever see any combat? I never saw any combat. Okay. No. And uh, no casualties in your area? No. The only thing I got involved in, my last trip into the Mediterranean, and that's what I got information on. Okay. It was on, uh, we were just going in through the Straits of Gibraltar. And I, I can remember speaking of Gibraltar, the first time I saw Gibraltar. I was, I for years, you know, when I was a kid, I always saw those Prudential commercials on TV with the Rock of Gibraltar. But it was that was from the land side that they saw it, and and I really uh, when I saw I was disappointed in it because um, one whole side of it was all had been repaired with concrete, where the the rock had uh, suffered bombardment through the different wars, you know, World War One and World War Two, and um, it didn't have the presence that uh, the Prudential commercial always. But I, I have pictures of it home, and uh, and just as we were going through the Straits of Gibraltar, this was um, a uh, there was the United States used to have um, in the Air Force there was a Strategic Air Command. It was called SAC, short for T Strategic Air Command, and they used to keep. I think it was way over six hundred uh, B fifty twos, which are big, our big bombers. And each one was loaded with four hydrogen, 150 kiloton hydrogen bombs. You know, this was the Cold War mentality. I remember uh, uh, the general, uh, the Air Force was headed at that time by uh, General Curtis LeMay, who was a real, he was a, a veteran of World War II, and he was quite a, a hawk, a military hawk, you know. And so... We used to keep 12 of these in the air all the time, these B-52s crossing the, uh, through the globe and things like that around the world. And this particular one used to go in over, uh, come out of North uh, the Carolinas, come in over the Atlantic and turn and go in across the, into the Mediterranean, go up by Istanbul, go into the Black Sea, go to the border of Russia, have their mission either they they got orders either to continue or to return back. Mm -hmm. So on their way back, they would pick up a um, a tanker uh, KC-135, which was always loaded with forty thousand gallons of aviation fuel, mm -hmm. and they would come back and um, and meet over in the Mediterranean, and it was right on the coast of Spain. 
in this one day, it was January 17, 1966, while they were trying to connect to refuel, they hit, knocked the wing off the B-52, and they blew up with 40,000 gallons of aviation fuel, the two planes. Oh my gosh. And uh, they were at 30,000 feet. You know, people there in that area used to see these two silver specks come to and meet every day at 11 o'clock, and they never understood what it was all about. But it was all part of this Cold War mentality that was going on at that time. Yeah. And so uh, they plummeted to Earth, and uh, the two uh, aircraft landed on the uh, coast of Spain, Palomera, Spain. And if you look that up on Google, and you'll see uh, articles in there still because it's, it's still radioactive and this area is still cordoned off. It's called the Palomares Incident. And these two, uh, these 450 kiloton hydrogen bombs plummeted to Earth. And uh, two of them broke up and landed all over this uh, tomato vineyard, which was terraced on the hillside. And a third one landed in a, um, a dry riverbank and skidded down this riverbank and um, got all dented up and everything like that, didn't, uh, didn't break apart. And the fourth one went into the Mediterranean. So we rushed to the scene right then. There was 11 airmen on the, um, the two planes. There was, uh, I believe there was seven on the B-52 and four on the KC-135 tanker. And they all, uh, seven of them, seven out of the 11 were killed. And I think the other four that were uh, picked out of the Mediterranean with the parachutes on, um, you know, they s just suffered severe burns and probably should have died, you know. Um, but uh, we pulled in there and what we did is we they abandoned about 15 miles up and down the coast and evacuated all the people out of there. And the United States rented that whole area from the Spaniards. And so we knew that the, that fourth hydrogen bomb was in the water and so we started searching for it. And we had quite a few ships there. We set up a picket line to keep other countries out, but we knew that at the time, we knew that the Russians had an atomic bomb, but we didn't know that they had a hydrogen bomb, and these were hydrogen bombs. So, actually, we spent 85 days there searching for it. First, we found it in 2,500 feet of water, and then it was on a very steep terrain, and it started sliding more, and went down to 3,000 feet, and finally, uh, we located it and uh, attached uh, three different lines to it and uh, hoisted it out of the, out of the water. That was a, a huge operation, huge operation. Wow. And um, GE had a, a, a bunch of technicians and engineers there. And then I worked with a, a, another one um, from Westinghouse. In uh, the head of the Westinghouse engineers was Jan Lindbergh, who was Charles Lindbergh's son. And he um, actually stayed on our board ship and he had a miniature submarine of his own, uh, but it didn't go down anywhere near the depth where this um, hydrogen bomb had finally landed. So uh, they brought over the first version of the Alvin, which is out of uh, MIT and it was based out of Woods Hole, Massachusetts. And that's actually the, uh, the craft that finally located the bomb and attached the cables to it. There was a huge parachute on this bomb. Of course, at the time, we didn't think they were, the detonators were set on these bombs. And uh, of course, we, when something like that happens, you don't know what the condition ever, you know, and, when you first get there and you know you're sitting on top of a hydrogen, 150 kind of hydrogen bomb, you don't know if it's going to go when or where it's going to go off, you know, but it, re it really wouldn't have made any difference because we'd have been the first ones to go, you know. Yeah. You know we, we'd have been 500 feet in the air. Oh my gosh. Um, but 
um, after a while, you know, with the silly young sailors, it became a joke, and uh, we just went about our job and uh, and f finally found it. And uh, we hoist the USS Hoist brought it up, and uh, we uh, loaded it on my ship, and uh, that was my last um, trip into the Mediterranean. And we brought it back to the United States, came th back through the North Atlantic, and um, turned it over to the Air Force. It was the Air Force's bomb. And we, we pulled up the Narragansett Bay and uh, to Davisville, Rhode Island, and, and turned it over to them. And, wow. Yeah. Gosh. It was quite an operation. Yeah. 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 So, um, so after all of that, what did you do after? Like, what, what was next? Well, we went back to uh, doing what we always do, you know, um, repairing ships and... Uh, upgrading them and keeping them fit for service. That was our job is to, uh, you know, when a ship came in and then it was, you didn't go about it in a casual way. When these ships were down, you know, you were uh, making our country vulnerable. They had to be ready to fight in, you know, any time. You know, that was, it, sometimes I believe that the Cold War the mentality of that was just uh, crazy. Mm -hmm. And uh, even still what's going on today, you know, with, um, with the Russians pushing the Ukrainians around and things like that, it's just senseless nonsense, you know, that people should enjoy the peace of the earth in their lives. And, yeah. So um, were you awarded any medals or citations? Well, we, we got a... Uh, award for the work we did in there in the Mediterranean. Sure we did. Oh, okay. yeah. We had a, um, a great little uh, admiral there. His name was Admiral Gaston. I think he was the first aviator that ever flew a jet off an aircraft carrier. And he was a very feisty. If you go in and look that up on Google sometime, the Palomera, Spain, you'll see all the pictures. And um, there had to be, there was um, all that radioactive dirt in those tomato vineyards had to be all cleaned up. And the beach was just lined. There was over 5,000 55-gallon drums full of contaminated soil, which all was flown back to the United States and put in a dump down in the Carolinas. It was, I think it's been moved out to Yucca Mountain out in, the mid, out in the west someplace now because that's where all our radioactive waste is being stored in these big caves out there, or salt mines or something. But then it was brought back to, into the Carolinas and, and put in, you know, they encased them in concrete and that sort of thing. Okay. But um, God guess was there, and the, uh, the general from the Air Force, General Wilson, and of course they worked close at hand with uh, the um, Spanish general. And... Um, and General Alissimo Franco was in charge of Spain at the time. Mm -hmm. And he was very insistent that those bombs be found and got, got out of his country, were well, rightly so. Mm -hmm. And even our ambassador at the time came down to the uh, water and had to prove to the people that the, the water was safe to swim in and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so he and his family went out into the ocean and swam and just to, because at the time we were there, there was no ropes. It was very primitive, and it was a lot of people run donkeys and sheep herders and things like that. And of course, when uh, we brought in all kinds of equipment to clean up all that uh, contaminated soil and things like that, and uh, it was a very at the time it was a very secretive mission. But then, I think in '67 or '68. A very, a very similar incident happened up in Greenland, Thule. Another one of our um, aircraft crashed up there and uh, it spread all this um, contamination, um, atomic uh, contamination all over the ground and things like that. And that had to all be cleaned up too. And uh, did you sustain any injuries during your service? No, never. No. So, uh, so kind of going back to during your service days, um, how did you stay in touch with your family? Or did you stay in touch with your family? Oh, uh, writing, 
Yeah, writing letters, sort of thing. Yeah, my my um, um, I, ha I had an older brother and a, sir, a sister, and um, I didn't I didn't stay too much in contact. My folks divorced while I was in the service, so I didn't really have a um, a home base to come to anymore. And they had gone their separate ways. And, and uh, what was the food like? Well, the food was fantastic. Was yep. What kind I, of things did you eat? We. Uh, I don't know. We had cooks that were always competing with one another, I think, to see how good they could. <laughs> and the food that was, uh, I can never complain about the food that we had on our ships. And we could, you know, you could eat four times a day. Uh, your breakfast, uh, lunch, and uh, supper at night. And then for the guys that had watches, you know, going on uh, at 12 o'clock at night, you could, uh, the, the mess decks were open again to uh, feed the fellows that worked at night on watches. So, you know, you were, because you have to stay on watches around the clock. You know, we had huge, big electrical switchboards and our generators, and, and that was a thing that we always, uh, you had to maintain your equipment. And uh, there was, um, you, you didn't come up with excuses why something wasn't working. You made sure everything was kept in good working order and w when you um, signed off on a ship, you know, we had many awards for our ship, efficiency awards for uh, a lot of re uh, destroyers and things like that when they came in. There was a couple of different kinds of classes of the destroyers. There was a gearing class and a Fletcher class destroyers. There was, we had hundreds and hundreds of destroyers and, and cruisers, you know, that were still in service in the 60s that had been World War II ships. And that's when my ship was built. I think the, the keel was laid down in 1941 and then it got put into service in, in 43. And just recently, I, I, I read a book on how, you know, it, my ship was in the Pacific during the Second World War. And, and actually there was a, a court of inquiry which was held on my ship. As in, and I, I read a book called Halsey's Typhoon where uh, Bo Halsey, who was a, a commander of all the naval forces in the Mediterranean at the World War II, his, um, he had, his task force had gone through a tremendous um, typhoon and f four destroyers were lost. They were sank. All of them, about a thousand men lost at sea because he wasn't watching the weather and uh, they had a court of inquiry on my ship. Uh, of course, it was wartime. He was so uh, inept on chasing uh, Japanese at the time, you know, he wasn't watching the weather like they should have been, you know. Yeah. And uh, did you ever feel any pressure or stress while doing, doing your job, or...? Did... I think that you could... Um, there was always pressure to, to get, keep these ships fit and get them back on duty, you know, you know because... Uh, you know, that's what a chain of command is. You know, the lowest guys always uh, take the responsibility, you know. And it, the last thing you want to do is come out with an excuse why you couldn't get something. If something needed to be done, you stayed up and worked around the clock until that ship was ready to uh, back online. Yeah. And um, did you do anything for good luck? Any good luck ritual or anything like that? <laughs> Gosh, I don't remember that at all. I don't remember doing that at all. I just, I just, um, you know, still I get together on occasions with some of the fellows that I serve with. Several of my friends are from Ohio and things like that. And, and it's just interesting to, you know, they're all, you know, my age is in the 70s now. And uh, it's interesting to see what they've done with their lives and uh, their families and it's a good thing, mm -hmm. yeah. And what did you do for entertainment? You know, I... <laughs> we watched movies all the time. Mm -hmm. Of course, we had movies and we'd swap them with other ships. And electricians uh, on our ship were responsible for showing the movies. We had to show one to officer's quarters, one into the chief petty officer's quarters, and one to the crew every night. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of our responsibilities. And then we used to have um, 
boxing. I boxed in when I was in the Navy. You know, we'd have a uh, contest where we'd box with other ships against their men. We'd set up a ring on our uh, mess decks. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I had played an instrument, uh, was learning to play an instrument. I, I had bought a, a mandolin out in, uh, in Poughkeepsie, New York, before I went in the Navy. And uh, and so when I was in places like Naples, you know, you could walk into these parks and these old gentlemen were there sitting there playing their mandolins and I used to sit in with them, you know, and they, they thought it was great and I did too, you know. Mm -hmm. and it was uh, re really a treat. Yeah. You know? And uh, did you ever go to any USO shows? I never was, no. Okay. No. And... Um... So did you ever go on leave, or uh, did you do any R&R &R while you were traveling around, especially... Well, yeah, I, I could get away, you know, if, um, if you were going to be there for a while and you had some leave, you could take a few days and, and travel off to, uh, you know, uh, if you were in the Mediterranean, you could catch... They had great train service mm -hmm. in the, Europe, and you could go off to a major city or something like that, and... Uh, if you had once you reach, uh, reached a certain rank, you could uh, stay off the ship overnight. If you were beneath a certain rank, you had to be back by midnight. It was called uh, you know Cinderella leave, oh. and uh, you, you had to be back by midnight, check in by midnight, or you, you were in trouble. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that was that was fun. And do you recall any particular, um, particularly humorous or unusual events that happened during your service? Um, well, everybody was always having fun. You know, it was it was always a hoop going on. You know, everybody was joking, and uh, that, that's. I I don't think I ever learned as many jokes as I did while I was in <laughs> in the Navy from all different parts of the country. Uh, I think one of the saddest things I remember was um, the day President Kennedy was killed. I was on watch down in the switchboard in the, on the, in the forward engine room. And a fella came down and said how the president had been shot. And, and I thought first he was trying to make a joke. And he relieved because I was going to go up to uh, have uh, lunch, and he came down to relieve me so I could go to lunch. And I never, ever remember seeing my ship so quiet. It was like it was a broken heart on the board ship. You know, everything was quiet. And then what we did was we got our ship ready for sea. We were in Norfolk, uh, Virginia at the time. And we got up, and the ship sit alongside of us. We uh, got their, they, they got their powered up. And as many ships were going out through the Chesapeake Bay as possibly could, because we didn't know who was responsible and what was coming in next, you know. And so it was, um, it was, it was a nervous time, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but we put to sea, and we stayed at to sea for about a week, just to be, just to make sure everything, and then we came back into port again. Yeah. And uh, what did you think of the officers and fellow servicemen and what you were serving with while on the ship? Of course, there's always a certain percentage that are a pain in the neck. But for 99% of the men, of course, the guy and the, some of the senior officers, warrant officers, and um, men in the repair department, they were men that knew their trades and they were just some of the best individual I had ever met. You know, that's, that's one thing in my whole life I have been lucky to come across was good people. Um, I've always tried to hang out with people that are smarter than I is in, in hopes that I might learn something from them. But I learned tremendous. Like I said, the systems and the equipment that I got to work on the opportunity was fantastic. And these men in the schools and everything like that, they were always willing to share their knowledge 
and uh, teach you something that you didn't know. If you, you didn't have to be um, bashful about asking. If uh, they knew something, that's what the military is all about. It's not in no one person. It, you work as a unit. And, and if you don't, and if you try to take credit for something, then that's, you can get scolded pretty well for that. You have to, you have to work as a team, and that's, boy, I, and that was a great example of that, you know. Just some, the best men of the country had to offer or in service, you know. And do you keep a journal? Did I? Yes. No, I didn't. I wish I had. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I get that a lot. Yeah. And um, uh, were, uh, so where were you when you, when the service ended? Like, where were you stationed when you, your New, Newport, Rhode Island. Okay. Yeah. And uh, tell me about that day. What did it feel like to be done? Um, I think I had a tear in my eye that day, yeah. Good tear, or were you sad, or? Well, I was, uh, I was anxious to leave. I, I had come out home about a month you know, my family had broken up, so uh, they were in different towns. So I came out about a month before, and I rented a small apartment here in town. And I lined up a job with an electrical contractor. So I got out of the service on a Friday afternoon, and I went to work on Monday morning. Oh, wow. Because I knew I had to do that, you know. I didn't, uh, I had a brand new Volkswagen bug, and so I bought a truck. And I started working, and I uh, working for the contractor, and I was moonlighting nights, doing extra jobs, and and eventually, you know, I uh, started my own business, electrical contracting business, which has been rolling for about fifty years now. Wow, wow! And uh, so, what was the homecoming like? Did you did your family celebrate you coming home? No, or, no, no, just no. sounds like I came home to an empty apartment, which was, um, it was a change from being. You know, um, my birthing compartment, which was, you know, the bedroom area, probably had over 300 guys in it, you know, because there was about 900 guys on my ship. Yeah. And just the silence was, uh, it was just flipping a switch from day and night, you know, from all the, the hooting and hollering and the laughing and joking and all the the nonsense that was going on, you know. Mm -hmm. It just was lonely, very lonely, yeah. Yeah. And uh, did you make any close friendships while in your service? Oh, yeah, we still get together, sure. You do, you keep, yeah. uh, keep in contact? Yeah. Oh, that's great. And uh, so, uh, so you went on as a career as an electrician? Like exactly, okay. exactly, yeah. And uh, so how did the military experience influence uh, your thinking about the military in general? I think everybody should do a service. I think it should be like Israel, and that everybody should uh, give to their country a couple of years. I think that it would make a enormous difference in the patriotism of young people to serve and have that um, opportunity to serve your country. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything greater. Yeah. And uh, did you join any veterans organizations? I'm a, a commander of the American Legion here. Oh, okay, very nice. Yeah. And uh, do you attend any of the reunions? I went to uh, one reunion which was held in Fall River, Massachusetts. And it was held on, uh, part of it was tour of the, the USS Massachusetts, is, which is birthed there in Fall River. And uh, let's see, was there, I might have gone to a second one too someplace. But the, 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 actually the, they're having less and less of them all the time because so many, you know, th this was a ship that served in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And so many of the uh, veterans from, you know, World War II and Korea are gone now. And so there's just not turning out for these. You know, and the ship has been um, dismantled. It was uh, in 1974. It went to a, a yard down in uh Texas, where they decommissioned it and uh, tore it apart mm -hmm. for more modern ships. Actually, um, my, my ship was named the USS Cascade, and all the repair ships were named after mountain ranges, the Yosemite, the Yellowstone, oh, yeah. and all the ships, different ships, are named after 
different things. Mm -hmm. And repair ships were named after mountain ranges. Yeah. Okay. And um, so how did your service and experience affect your life? Well, I think the discipline that I learned in the service, mm -hmm. that you learn when you're, um, when you're supposed to be someplace, that you damn well better be there. And, uh, and responsibility to each other. And um, well, I remember the first the t first job I had when I came out of the service, there was a, um, a Korean War veteran in this place where I went to work. There was probably 30 men working there. Mm -hmm. And you can hear different ones uh, when they got their assignments in the morning, uh, belly aching and moaning and groaning. And, and he said to me one day on a job, you can always tell the ones that have been in the service because mm -hmm. they take their orders and they do their job and that's all there is to it. And, and they don't, um, you don't hear the moaning and groaning. And you, just, you just learn responsibility and respect for other people. Mm -hmm. um, it was a funny thing when, uh, you know, sometimes when you're on board ship, you get a new fellow to come aboard and they got a little chip on their shoulder and everybody sort of gets on their case and after a while, they just become one of the guys, you know, and it's that chip wears off and they, you all become uh, shipmates and friends and look after each other. There was a lot of that that went on, comradeship, yeah. Okay, and is there anything you'd like to add that has not been covered in this interview? I can't think of it. Okay. I would like to thank you for your service and also for taking the time for, uh, to be interviewed today. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you very much.